This is Real Sales Talk. Real sales advice from real sales practitioners. Giving you tips on how to dominate your sales quota are your co host Sean Mitchell and Phil Keen. We don't have a process for referrals at most companies. I go into a company, I say, what's your referral process? They have no, well, what do you mean? I think that, I think that goes back to the premise that why do salespeople suck at prospecting? I mean, number one reason why they suck at prospecting is they don't actually do it. If you are successful and nobody knows in, 2000, in 2016, 20, 2025, you're not successful. If you ever want to find out what's going on in the company, get in the car and spend a day with the top three salespeople. You'll find out in five minutes. Because you can't be a trusted advisor without two things, trust and advice. I mean, you need both of them. What is going on, Real Sales Talk family? We have a an amazing episode ahead of you. Hopefully, you guys are here to, buckled in tight and ready for, for some great sales knowledge uh, with the one and only Mark Hunter. Mark, thanks for joining us today. Hey, thank you for having me on. I got my cup of coffee, so I'm ready to go for as long as we need to. Let's have go. fun. You got your sales juice? Uh, with sales you. juice, you bet. All right, so we are on episode four of season six uh, here at Real Sales Talk, and we're gonna talk high profit prospecting. We're gonna go through getting past the gatekeeper, uh, speaking to the C-suite, and then hopefully maybe even talk through uh, how, to, how to speak to the enterprise audience as well. Um, so let's let's start. Like you have a book, High Profit Prospecting. Maybe talk a little bit about that, and then we'll go a little more deep. Yeah, of course you got the copy of the book. Like, yeah, you know what? You know, I, I I wrote the book High Profit Prospecting purely because a few years ago I wrote the book High Profit Selling: How to Avoid the Discount. And what it really came down to was this is an expression I love to use: You can't take a Walmart shopper and make them a Nordstrom customer. If you start out with the wrong prospect, you're going to wind up with the wrong customer. So when you prospect right. It's amazing how you can get full price and really the customer you want. I really love that. And, and I already know that we're going to have to have you back on the show to talk about that because um, that's a really interesting one. You know, th there are probably two camps, one where, you know, they heavily believe in discounting others, which, which I am pretty partial to, which is building value, building up the value. And um, if you do it right, you don't run into that issue of, of uh, discounting. Yeah. Oh, let's do this. Let's just discount the first sale. We'll just, and then we'll get the price up later. Oh man, please. You're <laughs> killing me folks. I mean, how many times have we, I mean, Oh, although I admit when I was a salesperson, I used to do use that argument with my boss all the time, sell more value. <laughs> Yes. So let's let's dive into the book. Um, you've got a, a fantastic book here that uh, um, I would recommend everyone go out and get. It should be one of your fundamentals that you have on your sales bookshelf. Uh, it covers a lot of great topics. Where I'd like to focus on today is 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 the last section digs into the nitty gritty of a lot of the things that we really have not covered yet. Uh, like like let's start. Mark, with getting past the gatekeeper, why is it important to have that as a, uh, have that packed down that you know how to do and to do it well? Yeah, because, you know, uh, when we think about the gatekeeper, many times the gatekeeper is the silent decision maker. Because many times what happens is the gatekeeper is really the one who keeps the calendar, keeps the decision making, and it really is the go to. I can't tell you the number of times I've had meetings with CEOs that have come about purely because the gatekeeper has become impressed with me enough to allow me on the CEO's calendar. And so when you try to just blow past the, the gatekeeper, uh, you're doing yourself a disservice, especially when you're trying to get further up the food chain, because the higher up in the food chain you go, the more critical a role the gatekeeper plays. And so many people just, just fail to realize that. that. That's why I talk in the book about you ask the gatekeeper the same questions you would ask the senior level person because they're really judging. You know, the, the last thing they want to do is put on their boss's calendar, uh, the village idiot. <laughs> so guess what? If you're coming across as or a, a sale, you know, they don't want to meet anybody in sales. They go to purchasing. So if you come across as a salesperson, toast, get the hook. You're going to purchasing. How, so how do you, I, I know the gatekeeper 
doesn't want to put anyone on the calendar that doesn't make sense. And, and the gatekeeper definitely doesn't want to look silly for putting someone on the calendar that's n unnecessary. What are some of those things that, that, that the sales rep can do to communicate the value that, that, that their product or service offers yeah. and build that trust with that gatekeeper? Yeah, first of all, at that senior level, price is, is a non-issue. What I say is the further up at the food chain you go, the more strategic your discussions have to be. The more strategic your questions have to be. And oh, that's the critical piece. It's the questions because what you need to be seen is you need to be seen as a strategic thinker. Now, how do you be seen as a strategic thinker? Be seen as one of them, not somebody who is aspirational trying to get there. What do I mean by that? If you come across as, oh, wow, I... I, I'm trying to get a meeting with the CEO. Can you get me in? You, you'll never get it. But if you come across as one of the CEO's peers, now not their cozy, cozy friend, but one of their peers, one of their equals, then you've already begun to break down those walls. And one of the easiest ways I think we can do that is really by doing two things. One, you ask them the same questions you'd ask the CEO, which is you know what I explained earlier. But here's what I love doing. I love reaching out to them at 4.30, 5 o'clock even on a Friday afternoon. Now, here's why. This is what's interesting. That gatekeeper for the CEO or the CIO or the CMO, they're still working. They're still working because, and, and, and you know what? You call them and it's like, oh, but I don't want to bug you on a Friday afternoon. But you know what? They're, they're going to be really impressed with your call that you're willing to call at that time of the afternoon. That's totally counter to everything we, we've ever thought. It's the same way with reaching out to them at, at 7.30 in the morning. Many times that gatekeeper, they're there already. And they're gonna be impressed that you're working. Because the last thing you can afford to do is come across as a, as a salesperson. This is why I say, ne you never talk rates, dates, tech performance, specs, uh, guarantees, that type of stuff. Those are all code words for send them to purchasing, send them to purchasing. Again, it's all strategic outcomes. A Couple of questions that come to mind there. Um, uh, let's, let's take the first one. Is there a time of day that, that you shouldn't try and call, like too early or too late? Or um, what about the weekends? Well, oh, let me, uh, I'm going to give you two ideas here. I'm going to give you during the week idea and then a weekend idea. Now, Great. If, if I'm having a hard time reaching somebody, the, 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 the four minute window every hour is from 58 minutes after the hour to two minutes into the hour. Now, here's why it's so gold and it's gold. Generally, senior level people, they're in meetings all day. They go from meeting to meeting to meeting. And those meetings generally start at the top of the hour. So guess what? You call them right at the top of the hour. It may be the one time when they're in between meetings. They stop back by their office. They're checking messages, whatever. But it's the one time you can get them. Now, I am not an advocate of saying, hey, is this a good time to talk? I hate that. But when I'm calling a C-level person at the top of the hour, I will say, hey, is this a good time to talk? And many times they'll say, well, guess what? You are not my 11 o'clock conference call. I had that happen. I, I, I was trying to call a COO of a major Canadian company. He answered the phone. And I, I, I knew immediately that I was not his 11 o'clock conference call. You know, you can just tell it in somebody's voice. Yeah. So I asked him, I said, well, great. What time later today would be good to call you? Now, I left it in his court. And he looked at his calendar and he said, call me at 4.15. I called him at 4.15 and he picked up on the second ring. Now, this is what's interesting. The junior level person, the lower level person you do that to, they're going to give you a time when they're not going to be there because that's their way of blowing you off. The senior level person, they have a high level of integrity. They're going to give you a time and they're going to stick to it. I called him back at 4.15. We had a great discussion. So I love that 58 minutes after the hour to two minutes into the hour. Now, here's the other, time. Here's the other thing I love. Saturday morning emails. Oh, you know, the CEO never stops working. They never stop. But on the weekend is when they get a chance to work on the business versus in the business. And on Saturday mornings, I know a lot of CEOs, they get up early and they're checking email. They're going, they, they, they get a chance to kind of dig into email that they never get a chance to otherwise. So I can send them an email at 6.15 in the morning, 6.17 in the morning, 6.20 in the morning. They get it. And it's getting, it's very short, very, very short. If I don't have a relationship with them, I do not send any attachments. CEOs will never open an attachment. That is rule number 38 from the IT department. Because think about this. The CEO, the last thing the CEO wants to do is get their computer infected. They, they will never do anything to So unless I have a relationship with them, no links, no nothing. 
I'll just send them a very short email. I might say, hey, saw this article, in the, you know, take a look at the Wall Street Journal page A6, whatever. And just like two sentences, that's it, boom. It's something of interest to them. Now, many times they'll respond back to me at 7, 7.30 in the morning. Now, I'm not gonna sit there and ping them back 30 seconds later, no. But a couple hours later, I'm gonna respond back to them. Now, I always am gonna respond back a few hours later on. This happened to me the other day. Saturday morning, I get an email at, at, at like seven o'clock in the morning, unprompted from, a, from a, a VP of sales. And I sent him back an email about two o'clock in the afternoon because I want them to realize that, hey, I'm working too. I'm also working on the weekend. And if I wait till Monday morning, then it's like, you're just a stupid salesperson. You're just lucky. But if I can get into that discussion on the weekend, it works and it works very well for those senior level people. So I like the idea of a Saturday, Saturday morning email saying to the C-suite, one, what's the dialogue look like and what's your ultimate outcome you're looking for? Are you pushing them to get a phone call later in the week during the business week or are you looking to get them on the phone right away or, or what's, what's the outcome you're looking for? Yeah, I'm rarely looking to get on the phone right away. In fact, I'm really not going to because I'm not going to try to intrude that much un un unless they prompt it. What I will do is I want to just continue the dialogue. I want to get the dialogue. I want them to respond, me to respond. Then I might say, hey, why don't we grab time on the calendar next week? You know, and again, I keep it at that. My emails I'm going to send out on a Saturday morning are going to be strategically focused on some thought or idea, something happening in their industry, something happening in regulation, some, you know, now well, regulation, you just said regulation. Yeah, but you know, maybe it's a big fundamental change in a federal regulation that's coming out that's going to impact everybody. You know, what are your thoughts on that? And all I'm going to do is I want to put two or three bullet points. That's it. Brevity. Brevity. I want to, in fact, it's funny. I wrote an email to a CEO that I know of a large company. And I know the guy, very, very capable. And it was about three or four paragraphs. He sent me back a note. He said, I don't do well with long emails. <laughs> Call me. It was only like three or four paragraphs. But wow, wow, isn't that amazing? Brevity. Brevity will score you points anytime, every time. To talk, can you give some insight into you talked about about going more strategic with C level, right? How, how can you, how can a sales rep get insight into? We 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 did a we we highlighted some some tools about a week ago, Phil and I, but I'm curious to get your insight into how can a sales rep be informed so that on that Saturday morning, he or she can reach out with those yeah. brief bullet points around strategy. Yeah, what I'm going to do is I'm going to monitor the major industries. And I tend to, I tend to say I want to focus, and that's what I tell people when you're prospecting. Try to bucketize. There's a technical term. Bucketize yourself by industry. So in other words, you may have a dozen prospects in this industry that you're working on. So I can gain one piece of insight. For instance, right now in the news, I don't want to get political, but we have a lot of things going on regarding you know, EPA laws and, and health care and, and tax and and labor. I mean, I was just on the phone this morning with a gentleman out of Texas with a construction company. And he said, you know, I'm not quite sure what we're going to be doing a year from now because this labor situation is starting to get very, very tight, you know. And so those are kind of the, the strategic issues that I can begin to throw out. I said, hey, I just saw this editorial, I just saw this, curious as to what your insights are or, or something. I mean, back, uh, back about a year ago, we, we see a lot of, um, lot of deals in terms of, of Boeing aircraft. And I'll, I'll, I'll use them as you know, an example. And because I can use them because, you know, look what Boeing is doing to try to make penetration into these countries or those countries. And curious as, as if you're finding the same thing. So again, I might partner them with a peer that they might have a lot of respect for. Now I gotta be cautious in that. But if I know that, oh yeah, that's an, that's an industry peer that they like, they admire, I'll, I'll go and run away. But it really is, my, my whole thinking is this, on the weekend is when that senior level person is doing a little more thinking about the business in general. During the week, in fact, I had a conversation with the VP of HR 
for a company that has about 350,000 employees. Had, had this discussion about a year or two ago. He said, Mark, I get over 400 emails a day. <laughs> and that's after they get sorted. He said, my objective is to pound through those basically about two, three seconds an email. Because I have to keep my inbox, my mind totally clear for the three critical decisions I'm going to make every day. I never know what those three critical decisions are, but I cannot afford to miss those three critical decisions. So my objective is to clear through everything. So he literally blows through everything. And then he went on to tell me, he says, you know, on Saturdays and Sundays is when I can take a step back. I can, I can do a deeper dive into some books I'm reading, some papers that people have sent me in the company to read. Ooh, ah, you see? That's the train. That's the thought train you want to be playing on. Two to three seconds. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, can three you seconds. imagine that? I mean, just, you just boom, 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 boom. Oh, that brings up a whole separate issue on prospecting. That's subject line. The first 100 characters of your email. I mean, think about that. When you sit there and go, hi, I'm Mark Hunter, the sales hunter. I'd like to introduce, delete. <laughs> I mean, that's just ain't going to happen. <laughs> so how do you do this at, I guess scale, right, is what we always talk about. But how many accounts are you actively doing this with on a, on a weekly basis? So on Saturday morning, you sit down, are you chugging out 10 of these, three of these? Max, is it 50 max, of these? Max, maybe three or four. Max, max. Again, my whole objective is I want to have fewer prospects I'm spending more time with. You can't sit here and juggle 100 of these at one time. But I can juggle three or four a weekend. Now, I'm not going to hit you every, you know, if you're the CEO of a company, I'm not going to hit you every weekend. If I do that, <clears throat> boom, you're, you're gone. I might hit you once and then come back five or six weeks later and hit you again with something. I'm, 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 gonna, I'm, I'm not going to drip you every week because if I do, you're going to see me as a pest. This is the other thing to keep in mind. Lower level in the organization, the calendar is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. The further up you go in an organization, it's first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, fourth quarter. In other words, their mind, their, their thought, their planning is in quarters, not days and weeks. Are there some, so, so, you know, we've had John Barrows on the show and he's given some really great tips on tools to use like Owler. I think he's a big fan of Owler. Some people use Google News. Do you have any practical suggestions for how someone can make sure that they've got a pulse on that company or industry? Yeah, the best, the best two tools that I use is a Google Alerts. You just set that up for an industry for that person. And then there's five or six websites that I just check every day. It's Bloomberg, it's, it's Business Insider, it's, it's WSJ.com. I mean, those, and, and, and those kind of give me the rabbit trails if there's something I need. Now, there are industry-specific sites I might be following for six months or a year just uh, because I'm doing work in that industry, but then I, I, I fall out. Uh, you know, one of the things we in sales have to keep in mind, we really have to be seen as intellectually brilliant with our customers. And you're gonna get smoked out if all you know is one fact. <laughs> I mean, you're gonna get smoked out. Uh, you better really understand business, in general, life in general, industries in general. Um, I was with an MBA class the other night and we were talking about global stuff. And I said, what's the capital of Australia? 25 students in the class, only one could say it was Canberra. Now, I didn't ask you guys what the capital of Australia was, but it's I was Canberra. thinking Brisbane, so I would have been wrong. Everybody says Brisbane or, you know, you know, or Melbourne or Sydney or something like that. But no, yeah. And, and, and again, but this is this is the the knowledge. Uh, again, we could run down a rabbit troll here. I don't want to. But again, th th this allows you to really interface with that CEO. At, at, at their level. Uh, oh, let me give you a quick this. This is really cool. You call that gatekeeper. Never ask for a five-minute meeting because the five-minute meeting says, well, why don't you just put it in an email and I'll send it to them. And never ask for an hour meeting because nobody gets an hour meeting. Nobody does. Ask for 20 minutes. 20 minutes is the magic because you know what? Calendars really aren't set up for 20 minutes. They're set up for 30 minutes. So what happens is 20 minutes. Okay, I get you 20 minutes. And then what do they do? They block out 30 minutes. You now got your, but if you were to ask for a 30 minute meeting, oh, I don't know. I just can't give you 30 minutes. I'm not going to give a salesperson that, but 20, 
for some reason, that's just, that's, I have found consistently, that's the sweet spot for the amount of time to ask. Let's, let's kind of go back to the gatekeeper. Yeah. The higher up, the, the more important the person, the more likely they are to have a gatekeeper uh, because of that reason that they've got a lot going on and it's someone to help kind of sift through priorities. What are some of the conversations that, that a sales rep should have with that gatekeeper? Yeah. First of all, treat that gatekeeper as an individual with a lot of respect. Now don't pander to them because that's the last thing. That's the last thing. Don't play, don't, you know, Oh, it's all, no, no, shut up. Just treat them as a human being. But what I found is when you treat them with respect and, and it might be, but don't also be cheesy. Oh, what'd you do for the weekend? I have any plans for the Well, that's again, stupid. They're busy. They're busy, but you can be very cordial to them and say, Hey, just, I, you know, I, I know you guys are working on next year's fiscal plan but did have a couple of questions I want to ask. So what the, wow, you're right. We are working on our fiscal plan. Now, did you know that? No, but you know what? You can pretty much figure that about 20 weeks out from the start of the fiscal year, they're going to be working on next year's fiscal plan. I mean, there, 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 there's certain little things like that. If they're a publicly traded company, you know when their silent windows are, you know when they're going to release their earnings. And again, it, these are all little cues that you can use. Hey, I, I, I know he's got the call, the call, because it's always called the call, you know, next week, but just wondering if he or she had five, you know, had time to, because I'd like to ask him this, this, and this. And now what you're doing is you're respecting their time. You're respecting their cadence, their sequence of things. A another trick I love using, use Google alerts for that company. And, and I've used this a lot. I have, this has worked many, many times. Company will suddenly announce that they've acquired somebody else. And what I'll do is I'll immediately send an email to that CEO and the subject line is just that company's name. Whoa, wait, whoa, whoa, wait, we just, we just bought this. And wow, here's this email. And it, it will get looked at. Now you better bring value to that email. Hey, I got some insights regarding this niche and some of their customers views. Ooh, okay, interesting. You know, I'm not gonna get into anything that may, I better not know this because I'm buying a publicly, you know, we're buying a publicly traded, you know, they, there are some SEC situations for some companies you got to be careful of, but by and large, play the card, play the card. The worst is, okay, it doesn't work. Okay, move on. So what is, going back to the gatekeeper thing, is you're trying to get these first couple meetings set up with, with the C-level, how do you open that dialogue when you make a phone call into a gatekeeper? What, what's that look like? Yeah. I'm, I'm going to sit there and I, I might, I might call, I, I might call the CEO or the gatekeeper and I say, Hey, really what I'm trying to find out is, is how your company is going to be handling changes with regards to the new EPA regs that are going to be coming down. And she's going to sit there or he's going to sit there and say, well, why do you ask? Well, I'm Mark Hunter, the sales hunter, and we work with companies in this arena and really helping them. And, and what we've seen, and then you, and you immediately, and don't, don't talk too much. You immediately got to come back and ask them a question. Because if you give them too much information, then they can make a decision. Oh, well, I need to send you to purchasing. I need to send you there. But if you say, I'm Mark Hunter, the sales center, and we work with a lot of companies with regards to navigating through the regulations. And oh, how did your company handle the changes from two years ago? And, and did that affect your earnings? Oh, well, see, now what, now what I do, I engage them right away. See, so what I want to do is I want to engage them in and, and, and wow, he or she's not going to know the answer to those questions. But what is he or she doing? Like, wow, this guy's smart. Now that call may not go anywhere. Fine. Okay. It's okay. But then you go ahead and give them a buzz back a couple weeks later and you ask them another question regarding something else. You'll, you'll get in, you'll get in. So let's talk to the entry level salesperson, the SDRs or BDRs are sitting in the world. Let's talk to the MBA students that you just had a, a right. class with and sat in the front of them. They don't have that business acumen to go talk EPA regulations to a C-level, they just don't. So yeah. where do they go to acquire that knowledge, to start learning the knowledge? Besides, you say Google Alerts, that's, I think that's a great way to understand what a company's going through, but where do I go find that information out? 
you know, it, it really is not more, you don't have to take more than 10 minutes a day. And, and, and look, you've got 10 minutes a day because you're dinking around on Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat and everything else. So now what you're going to do is you're going to take this 10 minutes a day and go to Business Insider, which is really nothing more than TMZ for business. But, you know, if you were to take businessinsider.com and just spend 10 minutes on that a day, within two or three weeks, you're going you're gonna to be pretty smart about a wide range of things. And, you know, all you have to do, and, and this is kind of creepy, you know, fake it and you'll make it. Make the call with confidence. Because what I found is gatekeepers are never going to be ones to ask you such a challenging question to blow you out the door. Because remember, the gatekeeper for that senior level person uh, really understands integrity, understands respect, and they're not evil people because evil people get smoked out in this world of social media. You know, I mean, the last thing, you know, the last thing a gatekeeper wants to have is, is suddenly have, have some tweet going out there about how this company is evil because the CEO's gatekeeper did this to me. So they're really, they're really very courteous. You really have no reason to be scared. No reason. I have called many a, a CEO gatekeeper, and I have found them to be the most incredibly nice people. Because what are they? They're the front door to the company. So they really have to put on a, a good face. So don't, don't, don't be scared. Do not be scared at all. Here's the question you do have to ask yourself, though. Is it worthwhile for me to call the CEO? You know, they always say, oh, go in at the top, go in at the top. Yeah, I, I like that. But sometimes you can spend so much time trying to go in at the top when really the sale is going to be made down here. Remember, buying decisions at the top only have two things, really only have three things. One, they're strategic. Two, they're going to help me achieve an outcome that me, the CEO, really can't deal with any other way. And three, it's got to have a lot of zeros behind it. If it doesn't meet those, I'm wasting my time. Go in at a mid, go in at a mid level. You, you talk about in the book, uh, the different roles that people play. Uh, you go through seven different ones, user, owner, decision maker, champion, influencer, optimizer, road blocker. Mm -hmm. How do you, how do you identify what that person is that, that you you're read, talking to? Yeah. You read the book. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they, they, they emerge. Now, if I have time, I'm going to sit there and ask questions because I, I, I might ask a question. How have you made decisions like this in the past? That's a great way because, oh, well, boom, 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 boom. Then they're going to tell you other names of who are the decision makers. Or you're going to sit there and say, um, can I, oh, you can't get time on the calendar. You can't get time on the calendar. Well, okay. Well, that, that's clearly becoming a roadblock. Now, why are you... Oh, I see, because you really have somebody else you want to bring in, but not me. Okay, so now I see, you know, because again, everybody plays a role for a reason. I just don't want to know what the role is you're playing, but why are you playing that role? So when do you know when to go high? Go high and start high and go low. And when are, are there are there's some some guidelines for knowing when to go start high and go low, and then when to start low and go high? Well, it it sounds like you've been looking at my investment portfolio: buy high and sell low. So okay, <laughs> no, no. I mean you, you go high when you say that what I have is really going to be one of your strategical outcomes that the company is looking for. If it's not a strategic, in other words, if it's not a capital expenditure, there's probably no reason for me to be going to the C-level. If all I'm selling is a consumable, a repeatable purchase, there's no, probably no reason for me to go, unless it's a fundamental tactical change in how they do business. Now, even if it's a capital expenditure, I may not be going all the way up the food chain unless it's a capital expenditure that's outside the norm of what they're looking for. In other words, You've always been investing in this type of building as you build new buildings around the country. Now we, now we say, hey, look, here's a completely different type of building or here's a completely different, here's a completely different computer system. But see, computer systems, oh, that's technical. Ooh, that's software. Ooh, that's technical. Don't embarrass the C-suite. 
as soon as they feel they may be embarrassed, you're gone. Because uh, you, the, they protect their image. They don't want to be made stupid, see? So that's where, where software companies have a little bit of, have, have really a difficult problem getting into that C-suite because they don't, people don't understand tech and they don't understand the hardware that, go, that goes along with it. Now, I would hope the CIO does, but I'll tell you what, I've seen a lot of CIOs of Fortune 500 companies. Oh man, how did you wind up in this job? Okay, I won't go there, I won't go there any further. <laughs> So I think you bring up an interesting point. So let's say I'm talking to the CEO or a CIO who's um, inadequate in terms of his skill set of understanding technology, but they're ultimately maybe the signer, but not the actual decision maker because we all, we've all been in the position where you're going to get pushed down. What's your ask on the phone at the end of the conversation with the CEO? You talked about it. You talked about the EPA regulations. You had the conversation. You got them to start dialoguing, have good conversation. What are you asking for there? Yeah, for instance, let's shift this around to something that would use software. Sarbanes-Oxley law, when that got passed, or Dodd-Frank bank, banking law, a lot of software changes, a lot of things that had to, be, had, had, had to be done. See, so those are strategic decisions that have got to get made on the C-suite in terms of how well do we adhere to this, how well do we comply to this, but the implementation is actually three or four steps down. So what I'm gonna to have to do is I'm gonna to have to break this into a couple of different parts. One is strategically, because if I just go in and sell the software, well, that's fine, but we don't even know strategically if we're going down this, this path. See, so I got it up at the top. What I'm doing is I'm trying to gain direction that strategically, is this how, you, is this how your organization intends to comply with Dodd-Frank? See, that, that's, that's, a very, that's very much of a strategic, I mean, Jamie Dimon, you know, you know, that's a very key question at that C-suite. Even a regional bank, even a local bank is having to address that issue. But the actual decision is going to be made further down. Now, here's the risk. If I go in at the top and I understand what their strategic decision is, now I got weight, I got cachet when I come down lower in the organization. If I go in lower in the organization, you know, it's, it's now I got a double sale. I got to sell here and then I got to sell up there. Right. I think that's why so many uh, sales coaches and, and sales trainers are so bullish on the idea of starting high and then going low is because then you've got that authority. If that CEO forwards that email to someone two or three levels down below, that person's not going to ignore the CEO's request to take a look at the, at the product or service. Right. Oh, they are not going to ignore it. Now, I'll, I'll share with you because this used to be me. I, mean, I, I used to have a fairly senior level position in a company and, and notes would come to me from the CEO or the president of the company. And, oh, talk to this person. Okay. Yeah. Pain. Pain. See, it does get you in. But I'll tell you what, you better bring value right out of the chute because I, in fact, I used to tell this to my gatekeeper. This guy's just going to waste an hour of my time just to appease Phil. I'm doing it purely for Phil. <laughs> Phil's dead now, so I can say that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, that was cold. That was bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we're going to go ahead and, and wrap up and get into some, some of our content that we make available to our YouTube subscribers. But before we do that, Mark, I wanna give you an opportunity to, to tell our audience, number one, where they can buy your book, and two, how they can connect with you online. Well, you can buy my book, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, any on, online place. You can connect with me at thesaleshunter.com. Yes, Hunter is my real name. Hunter is my real last name. And a lot of research went into it. The saleshunter.com <laughs> domain was available. Okay, it's done. Boom, done. But hey, connect with me. I'm all over social media on most channels, LinkedIn, Twitter, I, et cetera, Facebook. I, and, I, yeah. I noticed I noticed Jeb and, and Jeb Blunt and Mike Weinberg did the uh, the intro in the forward and, and I know what they would say the best part of the book is. 
Of course, there. the forward and the intro. That's that's <laughs> that's Jeb and Mike. Yeah, 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 yeah. Jeb, Jeb said, you know, the book really sucks except for the forward. And <laughs> Weinberg says, you know, that, you know, and, and and okay, okay, this is funny. I had to get both those guys involved in the book. We are good friends. We are good friends. And there's another good friend, Anthony. Yeah, Reno. Reno. And, and so I quote Anthony in the book three or four times. And I said, sorry, Anthony, excuse me. I'm sorry. Next book will rotate the mix. <laughs> <laughs> that, um, that, that actually brings up a good point. Um, you are going to be at a conference next month, Outbound, the Outbound Conference. Um, you're going to be one of, the, one of the, the key speakers there. Do you want to give a little plug for that? Sure, I sure will. Outboundconference.com is the website. And it's Jeb Blunt. Mike Weinberg, Anthony Inarino, and myself. And uh, it's it's Prospecting Pipeline and Productivity, Atlanta, Georgia, April 13th. And uh, I just got it. In fact, I got a text like 10 minutes ago. Uh, there's only 40 tickets left. So wow. unless we can expand the space, uh, 40 tickets left, that's it. But yeah, that, that that's going to be a huge all-day event, the 13th. The sessions on the 14th are sold out. Um, yeah, it's gonna be a kick. I mean, it's gonna we, be great. We are gonna go un. We're gonna go unplugged, and um, we're gonna go rogue. I mean, we're gonna we're gonna throw some people under the bus. It, 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 selling strategies. The, I, I I look forward to that. I'll actually be there uh, representing Real Sales Talk. So looking forward to meeting in person. Good. Uh, I, in fact, I mean, we've had we've had everyone you just mentioned, Jeb, Mike, Anthony, uh, on the show as well. So looking forward to meeting them all in person and. Um, uh, I think it's going to be a fantastic conference. We'll, we'll, we'll over the next uh, several uh, episodes of Real Sales Talk, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that and, and what re our listeners can expect. Um, where can people, oh, so you, you already mentioned um, uh, the saleshunter.com, right? Saleshunter.com. It's the, it's the best way. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Cool. Good. So, so let's, let's dive into uh, a few rapid fire questions here as we wrap up. Um, this is something that we've been doing uh, to get to know our guests a little bit more, but but also to uh, put some content on YouTube exclusively uh, so that we can build that that listenership. So if you're listening to this uh, uh, recording, jump over to YouTube, go subscribe, just search Real Sales Talk, you'll find it. So uh, first question for you, Mark, is at what point in your life did you realize that you had a future in sales? At what point did you know you were really good at sales? Well, what time? Uh, two different points. It was, first of all, the Seattle Police Department. Seattle Police Department gave me my sales career because I got three tickets in the course of about six wow. weeks last semester of my senior year of college. I couldn't afford car insurance. <laughs> That's how I wound up in sales because I had to get a job that supplied me with a car. Now, when did I finally realize I was good in sales? <laughs> was, was probably about four or five years into it when I began to realize, what the heck am I doing? But you know what? I'm stinking successful. The third piece really came when it really, I really began to click probably about seven or eight years into selling when I realized, you know what? It's really about me. And I don't mean that arrogantly. I don't mean that boastfully, but I mean, you know what? It really is about the value I personally bring to the party. That's why customers want to do business with you. But it really goes back to the Seattle Police Department. I love them. Uh, thank you, Seattle PD. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> who, who? has influenced your sales career, who would you say has had the biggest impact on your success to date? Two individuals. The manager of the first McDonald's I worked at, a gentleman by the name of Phil Groff, 16 years of age. And John Canavan, who was a manager I had when I was with General Foods about 25 years ago. Both of them, incredible level of integrity, incredible level of respect, an incredible level of leadership. And those two gentlemen taught me more about leading people, about myself, than I'll ever possibly imagine from anybody else I've ever met. Yeah, a guy I, I worked for when I was 16 years of age working at a McDonald's. Wow, that's cool. This, uh, this next question, I'm, I'm admittedly stealing from Tim Ferriss, but I like the question a lot because I think it just provides some interesting insight. So if, if you were to be given a billboard on a major highway, what would that billboard say? Sales is leadership. Leadership is sales. I say that line a lot, but I firmly believe it. You know, the definition of, sale, of a good 
what a good salesperson does and what a good leader does is the same thing. They help others see and achieve what they didn't think was possible. Think about that. That's what a good salesperson does. That's what a leader does. I love it. I love it. I'm going to, that, that's going to be share worthy for sure. I like that. That's quotable. Well, we've come to the end of our, our interview with Mark Hunter. Mark, thank you very much for being on the show. You've given us some, some really valuable insight into gatekeepers and C-suite. Um, we're we, we're going to continue the conversation on a, another episode for sure. We, we want to get into the, the the price and selling value and so on. I think that's going to be a really interesting topic that we that we do sometime in the future to get you back on the show. Um, so thank you, thank you, Mark, for for taking some time out of your day. I know you got a phone call coming up here soon, but we appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Great selling. All right, absolutely. Real Sales Talk family, thanks for tuning in. And we'll see you on the next episode.